rhinoplasties, my one botched rhinoplasty that I had to get redone. But, you know, part of my transition, part of my journey. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming, Jeremy. I'm obsessed with you. Me. Um, you've been such an incredible supporter of mine and I've always been a huge admirer of yours thank and walking you. your show has always been sort of like a highlight of my career just because I remember watching um, so many incredible Moschino shows when you first made your return to Moschino. <laughs> I mean, you didn't return to Moschino, excuse me, when you first got appointed to Moschino. Sure. Um, and I just remember the casting being so much fun and the shows were so sort of um, extravagant. And there's not many people really anybody who does what you do. Thank and you. so it was always kind of a dream of mine or a fantasy of mine to get to walk <laughs> your show. So I remember that my first Jeremy Scott show before I walked Moschino was like a huge deal for me. And I remember right before I went out on the catwalk, we hadn't really talked very much. I remember I said to you, Jeremy, like this is a huge deal for me. And I wanted Aww. to walk the show forever. And you were like, thank you. And now, <laughs> I'm like, next. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was, wasn't that with the, the white uh, faux fur catwalk? I feel like that was that, that season. I, we, um, I don't, I remember we were in spring studios and I'm pretty sure I wore, I might be mistaken, but kind of like a moto suit. Uh huh. Am I wrong? Was it, was my first show the moto suit season? I feel like, you wore a long dress with a parka, but we've done so many shows together. I know it's hard oh, to. Oh yeah, I think you are right, and it was had like kind of like a a Mona Lisa yes, color yes, palette. Yes, yes, yes. I do remember. That's what I feel like yeah. is prior to the motorcycle. Yeah, because I think the motorcycle may be from my twenty year anniversary show. Was yes. Devin at that show? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, we'd already done some shows together, together by that, that point. point. Um, but they blur because we do so many and they're different places and different settings and yeah. different themes and different cities. I mean, you were with me in Rome even. I know. For that, that, was, epic. A, that was a lit show. That was a <laughs> fun show. And also that after party was so good. It was. And um, it was just incredible that you sort of, especially when I think of that show in particular, the show in Rome, and this is a, for people who are listening, this is a Moschino show that we did, and it was a pre-fall, I believe, or was mm -hmm. it a resort? Pre-fall. Pre pre-fall in Rome, and um, it was at the Federico Fellini. It was at the studio that he yeah. used to film at. Um, at Cinicita, Cinicita, I'm, my Italian's not the best, but it's the film studio yeah. that he would film at in one of the sound stages. He filmed many things at, especially parts of La Dolce Vita. And yeah. I was doing an homage to Fellini as a great Italian director and you know image creator who's, who's made us all dream so many yeah. amazing dreams and moments. And I was taking little dips of different films of his as inspiration um, to create and combine to the, have this like love letter to Fellini. I thought it was so good. And I thought it was also brilliant that you did the show there of all places because you mean, there was, you could have done it at a million different locations in Rome and you kind of picked sort of this maybe bar kind of barren austere place, which is a studio like and then you dressed it up with all these amazing props and um i think that was really cool because we were in rome but we were indoors and so it didn't <laughs> give it like it wasn't it wasn't just just being in that space by itself was like this very dreamy sort of experience mm. especially as an of a, as an admirer of film myself mm. i love a good I love a good Italian movie. Yes. From from the past. But speaking of the past. Because she's cultured. She's. I'm trying my best. I'm like, <laughs> it's a mess trying to keep up with it. I'm trying my, at, all, at all stages to sound as smart as possible. But um, I'm kind of nervous. And so oh. because I'm interviewing you. So if I sound dumb, please don't. No, you never sound <laughs> dumb. It's always also important to. I constantly ask questions and, and to to know more and to learn more and to understand yeah. more. I mean, that's part of the, the growth of an artist, the growth of a person, the yeah. growth of humanity. So never be shy about that. 
yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not so shy about asking questions. I think it's more just because I you know, don't want to sound stupid because I'm um a model girl who didn't mm. go to college, who sort of grew up in this world with a lot of like and li- <laughs> like this and like that and it, now I'm in LA, which is <laughs> a land of like this and like that. And um, it's sort of gotten like trapped in my It's cute. Um, the latter, Latter-day Valley is very cute. I think it's a signature that you should embrace. Yes, but um, I will get called out for sounding like an idiot. And so <laughs> I am trying my best not to sound like an idiot. Aww. So um, you grow up on a farm yes. uh, outside of Kansas City, Missouri. Correct. And I want to know, growing up on a farm, what is your earliest memory of fashion? Not loving fashion, but just your earliest memory of fashion. Of fashion meaning high fashion. No. No. Just fashion. Clothes? Mean, fashion meaning like an, like clothes. What was like the first time? Was there ever clothes that you saw around the farm that sort of inspired you? Because you use a lot of denim mm-hmm. in your work. In the opening look for the Marie Antoinette collection, um, everybody should see this collection. It's like mm-hmm. absolutely spectacular. Um, is a denim look. And so denim has sort of been like a reoccurring theme in a lot of your collections. Well, I definitely love denim. And I love denim because of the juxtaposition of doing something like what you're describing. Yeah. The, 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 you know, Marie Antoinette uh, historic shape and the figure and the, the padded hips and the farthingale and all that structure. But then having it rendered in denim completely subverts it immediately and so yeah. denim's a great foil for me in that respect as a material or, or so is fleece and i love those quotidian very american yeah. like sportswear like americana kind of things because i i grew up with that of course being american like you yeah. but had these dreams of high fashion and yeah. you know this kind of obtuse obscure desire for something um oat glam and that combination, I think, is so lethal. That juxtaposition is so electric. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely I definitely love that. But I, I guess if, to answer what you're saying, the first recollection of something like clothes that I thought was I was enamored with, I think it was five, and we went to Kmart, and that was in a big city. That was actually in Kansas City, so it wasn't in the town I grew up in. Yeah. So going to Kmart was a big deal. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I found a red satin jacket, shiny, shiny, shiny red satin, very pretty with white enamel snaps. And then it had blue and I think white stripes on it. Um, it was not Adidas, but it had like stripes, like two stripes, like it was a yeah. sleeve. And then I think it had color, like the, the cuffs maybe were white within the blue stripe. You know, it was very that, very like roller skating little jacket and I loved it and I used all the little allowance I had to buy one and I was I thought I was so cool and so hot and then um it was the first trend I ever created because then my brother and my cousin both went and got one too because it was like I was so in love with it I guess they fell in love with it so then my brother had one and then my cousin who was uh, slightly younger than him and I'm eight, nine years younger than my brother. So, um, at five, I was starting in my first trend. Oh yes, <laughs> Very, very trendy from the to- time you were a toddler, <laughs> toddler trends, toddler trends. Um, that's major. So, um, outside of that, when was sort of your next big moment where you kind of started to learn that maybe fashion was something, a world that you wanted to be a part of? Sure. I was in high school. I was in my freshman year of high school. I was um, flunking out of French class. I didn't want to be at school at all. I only went every day to wear clothes down the hallway like a fashion show. (laughs) Bitch same. (laughs) Mm. Even though the audience was not very receptive to uh, my attire, but still that was, I was like, I'm going to express myself. Yeah. And maybe it was for my other three friends who kind of saw the world like I did. Yeah. And everyone else was like miserable at us. But um, I then found at that time was Details Magazine, which was not a men's magazine yet. It was the original one. Annie Flanders was the editor and Bill Cunningham was given this cahier and he would do all these pictures and write articles and he would show all of the fashion that was going on in Paris, Milan, New York, 
um, London and also show you references about, okay, well, this is inspired by, you know, these paintings or this is inspired by this time period or this is inspired by this, you know, this thing that happened in fashion in the 60s or he would put all these things and put it in context. And so I devoured it and I learned so much. And that's where I fell in love with this next tier of like high fashion because that's where I learned at 13 outside of the, the mall there was like, you know, Paris runways. And I was like, I'm going to Paris. So I took that F, turned it to an A, became French club president, yes. got a French foreign exchange student, had my name in class called Pepe. And I just was like, I'm going to Paris. I'm going to get through this, these yeah. four years, and I'm getting the fuck out of Dodge. Yeah. Is that is Dodge the name of the town that you grew <laughs> no, up in? That, that's like an old time oh. movie movie western thing get, oh, okay. get, out get out of dodge it's an old dodge it's old western that's why it's not a reference you would know it's not glamorous hollywood it's, film talk oh, okay it's westerns get out of dodge oh, okay i get it like i got it no I my it. i was kansas city by that point when i was um in fifth or sixth grade i think we moved back to the city because of my father had lost his job and we were well kind of being almost homeless and so we yeah. went to the city to live at my grandparents house and so I then was in a, even though Kansas City is relatively, let's say, small for big cities, but it's still an actual metropolitan compared yeah. to growing up on a farm in a city of population 300. Yeah. D big difference. And so um, I was in high school in Kansas City at that point. And yeah, I was like, I need to get away from these people. They don't understand me. They don't appreciate me. I need to go find my people. And I knew that I had at that point a light that was burning inside of me, a flame that was burning stronger that I needed to leave this place to go to the next place. And at that point I was pretty certain it was Paris. Yeah. And, but you, in between those times also for reference, rest in peace, Bill Cunningham. Yeah. We love Bill Cunningham. Um, and he actually took pictures of me while he was still alive. Like the year it was the same year, I believe his, documentary came out mm -hmm. um and also i was in paris and i remember seeing him and i remember being like that's bill cunningham yeah. like that's the legend and i remember him snapping pictures of my like weird crazy like psychotic mew mew knockoff looks that i used to wear like my first season oh you cutie i was um, i'm fashion obsessed i know you are that's one of the things i love about you because you're so i mean not only obsessed, you're so knowledgeable because you're so passionate. And that's where I started yeah. I, as a, a fashion fan. I devoured those magazines, got uh, issues of ID magazine that my friend's older sister was able to get that were, you know, at this time it was hard to get. There was not this, you know, Instagram world where all these images are floating around. It's like you got your hands on a magazine. And yeah. if you got a magazine that was international in little Kansas City, that was a big effing deal. And you, know, you pour over that same magazine like a million times. And yeah. so I was learning about fashion and devouring everything I could about style and street style and what was going on. And I was, I was obsessed. And I, I recall when I first went to, cause I went from Kansas city to school in New York yeah. when Bill started taking my picture on like the street or at events and I knew exactly who it was, of course, because I had learned everything from him in the pages of details. And I, I even had a moment where he called my school because he had taken pictures of students from Pratt yeah. where I went um, at a party. So he called and he ended up calling the line that I worked at at, the, at my student job. And I'm like, Bill, I'm one of the people you took a picture. I was wearing the top hat with the long chiffon scarf tied around my neck where the Gautier one-legged um, tuxedo pants. That that was me. <laughs> and he was like, oh, child, that's so great in his sweet, charming Aww. way. And well, tell me who is the girl with the... I'm like, that was Elenita. And the mm. little girl, though, was like, that's Michael. And I was describing all the people so he could put the credits for the paper. Yeah. And then he sent me prints that he had done of us. Oh, and it was... That's amazing. It was amazing. And, and to get to have him chronicle me as a student then into my actual career and there's a, a picture that was taken at the last show of mine in New York that he yeah. was at and it was snowing and I came out and he and I were talking and there's a paparazzi picture of us from a distance talking and I always cherished every moment I had talking with him because I I, I 
just loved him. He was gentle and inspiring and so encouraging. And yeah. I'll never forget because he kept, he said one last time to me, like, um, you know, yeah. Give him hell, child. <laughs> Give him hell. Yeah. And I was like, it's so cute because he was so encouraging of of, of the underdog yeah. and of you know uh, unusual fashion and yeah. something exciting and something glamorous and something different. And he loved that. He was like us in yes, a way, you know. Absolutely. And I and I think it's he's so special in that sense that he was really one of those people who had such a strong passion for clothes and for fashion and for what that meant to the world and what that meant to society. And he knew the power in them and how inspirational and influential that they could be that, you know, he spent his very last moments even, I mean, when I, not literally his last moments, but he spent his last, you know, final years just really devoting himself to, um, his his craft and his art of documenting fashion and thank god we he was around because he really did capture street style in an era where people were not paying attention in the same way he did so i think that's really incredible tell me a little bit about what it was like applying to pratt getting into pratt like the whole college experience because i remember when i was applying to fashion schools i actually visited pratt i visited parsons i visited all these places Mm -hmm. and then modeling happened which was just like a stroke of luck for me but how did you sort of fall into like the education system of fashion i was in high school studying um well obviously in high school you study everything here in America, but I was very focused on art and I was doing a lot of ceramics and sculptures and like handmade paper sculptures. And I I just thought I would be a sculptor or a, you know, an artist of, you know, ceramicist. I don't know. Like I never really thought too much about it. I just loved clothes and I would draw them all the time and draw my friends wearing them and all that stuff. But what I was making, uh, yeah, I would alter clothes, like go to the store every day after school. I would alter clothes, sometimes make something from some kind of fabric or some kind of even paper that I loved. But I wasn't trying to necessarily design clothes. I just really wanted to create looks that I I thought were great for me and my friends. Um, and one of my teachers was like, you should go to fashion school. And I thought, this is so weird. Why would I go to fashion school? And she's like, well, when you, you know, be a fashion designer. I mean, you, you obviously love clothes and you're always, you know, you always look so cool and forward and interesting or whatever, you know, she was using yeah. as a term. And I was like, huh and then she's like well you should go to fit and i was like okay well i'll know so you know being kind of just like wanting to go to new york vaguely not sure at that point i wasn't sure if i was going to go to california or new york actually i was a little more obsessed with los angeles even though i'd only been there once as a child i was a little intimidated about new york just because in the movies you know you always see like it kind of looks dangerous or there's like so many people on the sidewalk it's like well how am I special if there's like a zillion people walking down the sidewalk? So I took her advice and I put together what I thought was a portfolio and sent a, a a letter and, um, my, my sketches to FIT. And then after a few weeks received everything back folded up, like kind of really in a very, um, derogatory manner like you know like you know it's artwork like a, you know. like like a sloppy kind of crude like yeah like why did you fold my artwork it's yeah. a little rude and then i then i got a letter a few weeks after that that said we're sorry that we cannot accept you because you lack originality creativity and artistic ability those three terms i can say it exactly that because it shook me to my core because that were those were, and they still are my strengths yeah And even as a person who hadn't yet demonstrated in a professional way, I was demonstrating that at school. I was even, I mean, teaching other like freshman classes for my art teachers, certain subjects like parts of ceramics, parts of handmade paper, because I was really good at it. And they were like, oh, you should teach that because you're so talented at it. I was even given my own office in high school in the art department so I could lock my own stuff and like work at my own leisure. Cause I had taken every course there was to, you know, sign up to. So they had to invent numbers for me. So to kind of take, try to take away the artistic, you know, ability, I was like, wait, 
I was shocked. I cried. It was devastating. It's like the uh, great Oz telling you, you know, something, you know, and you, you, you know, like Be- yeah, uh, being denied by the establishment, yes. which has also been a motif of your a very yes, long girl. career. But I, I hope you don't feel too bad because guess who was also rejected by FIT? <laughs> yes, your girl. Ma'am. Yes. <laughs> um, well, whatever. Their loss. FI- FIT's loss. Exactly. Um, I'm really grateful that I actually got rejected by FIT because like that sort of propelled me forward into modeling in a way. I was like, well, is gonna yeah. fucking reject me i'm gonna go and like start this modeling career and i figured that's how to, i was gonna break into design was yeah. through modeling um and then i learned about how hard it is to become <laughs> a designer and i was like well maybe not um but i am also very curious to hear sort of about your time in college because you were a little bit of a club kid weren't you I was without very frank, without doing drugs and without really doing the party aspect. I liked the dress up aspect. Yeah. But I was best friends with Jenny, Jenny Dimbrow, Genitalia. She was my muse. I have and, no idea who Genitalia oh, is. Do you want to tell me about who sure. Genitalia oh, I thought, is? Since you knew this, you would know that. She's the she had shaved head, shaved eyebrows, and pierced cheeks. She was famously in the Calvin Klein CK one ads that um that uh Steven Mizell shot and she's She's who Chloe plays in Party Monster, but she's, oh, okay. Chloe doesn't look like her in the film, mm. but she is the actual cover picture of Michael Alley eating the brain. And that's Jenny. That's the, that actual, I have the real poster where it's Jenny that they've mocked it from, but awesome. Um, so I would go, Jenny went to NYU and I was at this point going to Pratt and I gotten in and I had, I don't even remember how I met. I think I met Jenny because I was friends with this Japanese girl because I studied Japanese and I, I always loved Japanese culture, still yeah. do. And I had a friend who um, I could speak Japanese to, so I'd go to talk to her and have lunch with her. And I think in the same dorm, I met Jenny and Carlin. Um, and Carlin, I don't know if you if you ever saw her pictures, she looked kind of like Christy Turlington at that moment. And she had the Chanel moon boots that were then platformed with giant cc's extra i don't know if you ever saw these i i feel like i have seen the cc um extra platform, platform shoes so yeah she had the moon boot in that moment and then she like went and did the club kid maneuver and yeah then had the platform but then had it cut out with cc so carlin was like this goddess like we actually walked in backstage to like an Anne show and some other shows because everyone just thought she was chrissy turlington when yeah. she wasn't wearing obviously the moon boots which were like wait what's going on but just like her like you like pretty girl off duty like style like she was it and like Love that. Cr- Christy got the bang she got the bang <laughs> so we would just like stroll in like oh yeah like she's getting her makeup done we gotta really hurry and um I love. but I would get I would make an outfit for Jenny and Carlin usually every week um go to my internship at um I think it was like 10th and 5th Avenue around the corner was at that time the coffee shop yeah. And then they lived in the dorm next door. So then I go get them ready, usually go with them to whatever night they were hosting and then um, bail out within, you know, an early enough hour that I could still take the subway back to Brooklyn to get, you know, the two changes to get to Pratt in a safe enough time um, that I wasn't feeling like mortally scared for my life, especially being like done up, like, you know, like you know, makeup forever, like colors all over my face and wearing something very androgynous, you know, for lack of better terms, you know, something that's provocative in that time. And, um, and then being on public transportation at like, you know, some hour like that where people are already a little loose. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, 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 so I participated in that way. I was also like doing I think I had two jobs, two um, internships and the school like work study thing as well as school. I was like trying to like pay for school, trying to do all the stuff, still make things learn by, you know, interning at places to learn things, you know. Um, So I didn't really party and 
And I mean, Jenny knew that too. So like she always kept like Michael away from me and I never really got, everyone else is very peripheral to me. Like Michael, Michael, Michael Alec. Like, no, I don't, I don't know who that is. Either. He was the kind of the leader of the club kids. Oh, the leader of the club kids. Yes. Okay. And then, um, you know, like cool people. I don't know if you know, Walt paper. There was like cool people that had great looks. Kabuki actually. Oh yeah. Was, I know Kabuki. Kabuki very well. was Kabuki starshine at that yes. point. Amanda. I mean like Richie rich. There was, it was, you know, there, there, they were, stars they were like superstars at that moment um but jenny was my muse and my friend and she did all my student shows yeah and i made clothes for her all the time and i loved her and drew her every day a million times over and she was that was kind of my foray into it i had like more the look without the lifestyle i wasn't like I didn't have a list. I didn't have like, mm. I wasn't giving out drink tickets. Yeah. I, I wasn't employed by a club mm -hmm. in New York at that time. Yeah. I was a, just a student. Yeah. But that's awesome that you were even able to be a part of that sort of incredible movement in fashion that has just really sort of inspired so many different collections and artworks. And I also, I, I kind of want to ask you, at that time, did you ever sort of associate with any other designers that were kind of up and coming? Because like, you always hear about like Mark Jacobs and Anna Sui, like in the mm. Mud Club and places like that. So I, I, I always mm. wonder, like, did you ever sort of like grow up around other designers that now have mm. sort of created? No, I didn't. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean. I was obviously obsessed with fashion. I remember meeting Mark Jacobs on the street and I did yeah. do an internship with him while I was in college and he was always so lovely with me, had me set at his desk and Aww. spoiled me because he loved the way I dressed. And he actually was also friends with Jenny, ironically, but I, I we never really discussed it because um, I, I was a little timid. I didn't want to like, you know... I was just happy to have this internship and yeah. it would be like, well, actually you're friends with my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but he, he was lovely. And I remember meeting Todd Oldham on the street at an ATM once. Yeah. And, um, but they were already established designers. I, no one that I grew up with in that way came up with in school, um, ended up having any kind of career that was in, and I don't think some of them had uh, ambitions to do what I wanted to do. Yeah. And that was one of the things I learned once I was at school. I kind of thought everyone wants to be like a high fashion designer. And then I realized, no, like she wants to like do like walkabout costumes for Disney. And she wants to do like sportswear at Puma. And, you know, she wants to have her own dress shop. And, yeah. you know, there's a couple that were like very like high fashion y, but um, I don't know what happened to them because I'm um, no longer. I'm yeah connected to them but you it's you <laughs> when I think of Pratt I think of you and Betsy Johnson oh yeah and it's interesting too because you're both very kind of like arty designers sure. and um both very fun and so I kind of just wonder if that environment was a great place to nurture that sort of like more creative side whereas maybe an FIT or a Parsons is a or even um, a central St. Martin's is a little bit more, um, focused on either the sewing sure. or the product development, churning or... out something in a formula, I yeah. think is really what it is. And you're absolutely right. And I did do, um, uh, interview at, at Parsons and they actually said they would accept me if I worked more on my gouache painting of my illustrations, which I was kind of like, oh, hey, gouache. I, did, I didn't even fill for gouache. I mean, I did some gouaches for them because yeah. they asked, but I was like, I, I, that wasn't my genre of expressing myself. And what was great about Pratt is they saw that I had ideas and potential and they were willing to help teach me the, the fundamentals to create instead of kind of like, well, get your fundamentals better, then come back. They were like, well, that's what we're here for. We're a school. So, We'll teach you how to, you know, illustrate the figure and how to cut and drape clothes and make them. And so I actually had a very rigorous education, especially of cutting, sewing, pattern making. And, yeah. you know, if things weren't made right, the, they would tear it apart right in front of you. And like, OK, you need to do it again because that's not correct. Yeah. And I had to learn how to sew and pattern, you know, all my garments and, and, and make them. And that knowledge even today gives me the backbone to be able to create things that are sometimes um, 
so imaginative that they're out of the ordinary because you have to know how something can work to be able to div divert from the tradition, you yeah. know? And even if today I no longer make patterns or no longer sew the clothes that you're gorgeously wearing right now. Thank you. You know, I, I still have that backbone from having to do that, having a four year, you know, degree from Pratt and then going to Paris after and starting my career and having done all those patterns and sewn all those garments for the first two shows entirely myself. Yeah. And partly for the third and, and, I couldn't have done that without having that education. So I couldn't even have started my, my career the way it did if I wouldn't have known how I could do that myself. Yeah. Okay. So the New York moment is over. You're <laughs> on your way to Paris. <laughs> like what is going through your head when you're going to Paris and you're moving there by yourself? And I, I know I'm, I, I've, I didn't want to ask you any questions that other interviewers sure. had asked you, but I am going to ask <laughs> anyways. Um, I am just curious to know what was it like moving to Paris and I, I, you were basically homeless. Yes, I was homeless. Uh, yeah. And, but you had this opportunity to go. Um, and what was it just like I, I remember the first time I moved to Paris when I graduated high school, actually, and being there by myself and living in like some creepy art dealer's apartment it was having like threesomes in the kitchen while I lived there. You know, you know how Paris is. Darling. <laughs> so it's <laughs> so what was it like for you being like this young kind of naive fashion boy moving to Paris? I was just steadfast and certain that I needed to be in Paris. All my favorite designers at that time were almost all showing there at that point. Yeah. And so I thought, you need to go where the action's at. You need to go where the thing that you love is. So I picked a date and I just made booked a flight. I took all my summer job earnings to pay for that ticket. I knew this kid who was a foreign exchange student um in New York from Paris who was working at the same internship I was at that moment. And he was like, well, I have an apartment that's still um, on my lease for another week once you get there. So you're welcome to stay there for the first week. And my friends have the keys there and they can let you in. And then, you know, you at least have a place to land to. So do I you remember what R and D's mom you were uh, like, it was what above area the Christian Paris? Louboutin store, the like the oh, one gag. Yes. Uh, I, no, I know exactly where it was. It was like a gorgeous. On um, the one that's, I don't know what the street Avenue was. Montagne? No. Um, it's near, it's near, uh, it's like in the Passage. Oh yeah. Okay. Do you know what yeah. I'm talking about? I feel like it's. There are many Passages in yes. Paris. Do you kind of, do you remember if it was like kind of like central Paris? It was central. Okay. It, in, in like today's terms, well, Colette's no longer today's terms. It would be not such a far walk from Colette. Mm. Um, I guess it's near Galler. Um, also rest in peace, Colette. Yes. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know that there was a Christian Louboutin store at that moment there, but it's that same passage where it, for a long time he had at least a store and a press office, at least yeah. my time of living in Paris, because he did my shoes with me for several of my early shows. So I was going back to that same location as a designer at that point, working with him. And I had always remembered that I had been upstairs with a Garfield phone from the 80s. Um, for a week uh, in this apartment that was my mine for one week. And then I was actually homeless and I stayed with a couple of that um, French kids friends who had met me and had helped me get an apartment and they were charming and then had met people. And I've never, I can never say a bad word about French people because I slept on so many people's couches or for a week at someone's house that they were going to be away and people who barely knew me yeah. didn't really know much about me but took a chance and was kind because they thought you know oh well this like american kid seems nice and wow like i like his style or he's you know whatever they saw in me and i i, w I learned so i walked that whole city i know yeah. my way you could blindfold me drive me around for an hour drop me off somewhere and then i can start figuring myself back because i've seen every inch of it on, on foot by walking from having to stay at different places through that whole time and learning, you know, 
all the different nuances because it's a very, new, as you know, nuance with the curvy roads and the different yeah. ways it curves and turns and swirls. and <laughs> Yeah, you kind of like figure out where you are based on the landmarks. Yes. You're sort of like, okay, I remember that trim on this building. <laughs> so that means I'm here. And oh, that water fountain with like um, a half dead homeless man like drowning in it. That's like, okay, I'm here. And then, oh, that's my favorite, like, little place to get coffee. So we're here. So, yeah, definitely Paris is easy to navigate once you understand and know the landmarks. But I would also agree with you that French people get a really bad rep for being sort of, like, assholes. Yeah. And my experience was, mm-hmm, they are when I, you first meet them. <laughs> they're, they're, but I, what, that's what I enjoy. People always accuse me of being a bitch. Oh, really? Which, uh, mm, mm-hmm. I can't imagine. I honestly can't imagine because I just think you're so adorable and so lovable. Oh, thank you. I think you're adorable and lovable <laughs> too. Um, Yeah, but I kind of have, but I'm also opinionated and I speak my mind and I'm also just mm. not going to be like, what I ad- admire about French people and sort of like French culture is their ability to sort of like not give too much of themselves away at first, Mm. which I think is a really sort of wise thing to do. And maybe that's just because I'm like damaged goods from being like a trans, an abused transgender child or whatever. But, um, I always kind of admired that it took, it takes a second before they trust you. And then once you're in, you are in for life. Yeah. Um, but it seems like you had a very good, you met the right people because I I think I was very lucky to meet, people that were very warm and and kind and I was also just so blindly determined that this was the right thing for me to do and I just wouldn't give up um and you know I learned a very important thing because you know I wasn't I I hoped to get it I had hoped to get a job to set the record you know straight like I was going there thinking I want to get a job specifically with Jean-Paul Gaultier and I was hoping to learn and and be able to learn even just having an internship not even about oh I need to pay a job like literally kids I'm talking about like I want to pick pins off the floor and be in the environments that inspired me and it was such a complicated situation because at that time it may still be that way as Americans, we don't have insurance for students because we're usually on our parents' insurance. Yeah. So when you're uh, 20 or 21, whatever, I think I was maybe 19, 20, 20, yeah. 21 when I was getting there, they wanted proof of insurance that I didn't have. And we don't have it for our schools as students like yeah. they seem to do. So they couldn't legally have me as an intern because I didn't have insurance and I wasn't insured personally. Yeah. So that was my big obstacle and I getting insurance, I just, my obstacle <laughs> um, as a 26 year old woman living in Los Angeles. Yeah. And especially when you have no money and you're homeless and you're like, well, I already have insurance and I'm not unhealthy as like a lot of young people feel. Yeah. It, you know, I, I just was like, I didn't think about it when I say it to you now. I think, well, why didn't you just focus on getting your fucking insurance? So you could have gotten the internship, which sounds very logical. It just didn't come off that way to me. Yeah, I just but when thinking, you're young and living in Paris, you're sort of like, fuck the system. Like, why do I need insurance? Um, I feel that way now as a grown adult <laughs> sitting here next to you. I'm like, damn this. I, I, I wish, I wish America would just have a socialized healthcare system because honestly, I I'm, I'm like on the cheap good insurance. It's like 300 bucks a month. And I'm like, damn, how does, how do people just come up with 300 bucks a month? to pay for this random like thing that they need just in case. And then of course we're in a pandemic and every like, yeah. I, I mean, it's a, the healthcare system in the United States is a mess, but that's a conversation for a different day. But and it's Ted, just, inter- Teddy's next guest is uh, Senator Bernie Sanders coming here to talk about healthcare. I, I wish <laughs> I, Bernie or AOC, if you're listening, <laughs> this is your invitation. Um, I but I think, I, I think that's just, it, I think that's really interesting that you um, ran into these obstacles, but yet completely through motivation overcame them. I have one more specific question for you. What was the hardest night when you moved to Paris? Did you have like one night that you remember that sticks out in your head? Like, (laughs) like, like a night that broke you down. Hmm. I don't know if I ever got broken down. I remember one of my friends from, Pratt came and she was in Paris and we went and had dinner and then um I didn't have a place to stay and 
I kind of think I, I might, I'm not sure about the fact of this. I don't know if I thought she would have a place, but I think her place was also with somebody. So I couldn't just hang out with her and we wanted to hang out. And then, um, it was a, one of a couple nights that I had to sleep in the Metro and then woke up with, you know, the police, you know, with their baton kind of whopping you on the side, like, Hey, Hey, get up. Like, at least it was the police and not like a herd of rats because the rats in the Paris Metro, mm, (laughs) they look like chihuahuas. They are so big. Oh my goodness. I, I, yeah, I didn't have a, I didn't have a a rat wake me up, but I was still very startled to have, you know, Mr. Police officer or, or whatever he was from the Metro. Uh, You know, those, those things were definitely like, not I didn't take them super lightly I mean I was like you know uh, you know it, it's it, it it's like wow how where am I how am I getting past this and how am I going to make these dreams come true and you know why am I here this isn't my country and you know is this the right idea and you know do you have to be here and you don't know anybody you're barely able to speak the language at this point you're just learning the language and you're you know, I mean, yes, I studied French, but like real life French and student French is really different. I mean, it gave me the basis to be able to like, je voudrais, un, you know, yeah. morceau de pain, s'il vous plaît. But it wasn't like, okay, I'm going to talk about like my ambitions, you know, yeah. and um, and trying to just understand what I was doing. And so that that part was definitely the challenging. But, you know, that's why I learned a very great lesson. And I can share this with you and everyone I remember kind of having, maybe this is the breakdown you're asking for. I remember just feeling like, I don't know what to do, where to turn. And I called my former boss who I'd interned with in New York. That was around the corner from Ginny's dorm. And I just said to her, I was just like, I don't know what to do. I I did this and this and this, and it's not, it's not happening. X, Y, Z didn't equal, you know, or A, B, C. And she was like, well, it's not always like plan A or plan B or plan C. Or plan D. Sometimes it's plan, you know, X or plan Z or, you know, plan Z dash four, five, seven. And I was like, wow, like, oh, wow. You know, just because this didn't work right this point, like yeah. it still could come and it doesn't have to always appear the way you imagined it to appear. You know, yeah. that 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 opening, that entrance, that 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 epiphany you know all that stuff and and just because you thought well i'm gonna go to paris i'm gonna get a job you know with jean paul gautier and then i'm gonna learn all about fashion then maybe one day i'll have my own you know collection because i honestly thought i don't even think i was really obsessed with being my own designer as much as like working for someone and then maybe one day taking over for them i i didn't i wasn't like so caught up in my own ego um but what happened was I had to express myself. I was expressing myself on my body yeah. every day and I needed to get that out. And so I just was determined from that moment to create a fa- my own fashion show. And I was just, I'm just going to do my own show and just show people my voice. Yeah. And that's how it happened. It was just out of being kind of squashed because I couldn't seem to get an opening and an opportunity, but I had this burning inside me that I needed to share this and a I, calling. Yes. And so, and not even under, understanding it completely and not even thinking I'm going to do this show and then I'm going to be doing shows for the next 20 something years or whatever, you know, I just was like, I just want to put this together and share this. Mm. And that's how it started. Yeah. Let's talk about some of those first sure. questions because Can I we, went through the archives of Jeremy sure. Scott last night and I was so, um, I was so amazed, honestly, Aww. to see some of the the differences between the way you design now and the way you design then, but also some sure. of like the consistencies. I love that. I'm so curious. Um, so the first consistency, I think I I I know this is the controversial collection for you, but the gold collection. Sure. I was looking at the gold collection, which had money prints. Oh, uh, is am I am I am I thinking of the no. right collection? No, I I don't think it had money print in there because i don't i didn't had not done a print yet but it was all gold it was all gold am i uh, are you thinking the dollar sign green and black 
I was thinking of the, yeah, they were like, they looked like $1 bills and it sort I did of was, so, I've done so many monies. So yeah. I like, the one that's like a dollar, that's a jacquard with my face on it. Yes. That's from my game show, which I did a game show myself, yeah. which obviously, you know, that you, uh, I, the audience doesn't know you were in my revisit of my theme as a Moschino game show. I thought show. that was the gold show. No. Oh, okay. That, um, that's the game show. Okay. And it rotated and it was a revolving one disc at the Cirque du Ver. The gold show, which was the my technical fourth show, which everything was gold, lame, leather, gold, actual gold, lame, gold chains that I had um, um, sponsored. They were 14 karat covered gold chains and gold knits and gold porcelain corsets and gold uh, porcelain masks and all this stuff. And part of the girls' faces were made up to look more mature and some were made down to look more demure. Yeah. And Christian, that was the first show I did with Christian. And he, I wanted one high heel and one lower heel because I had read this story about how Marilyn Monroe would saw off a little bit of her heel to have the sexy gait. But we did it more dramatic. And um, some of the models really walked with this very almost what some people perceived an awkward gait. Yeah. And, you know, in it's hard to understand this today, but showing a, all sh a show of all gold at that moment was shocking because it was a height of minimalism. Okay, so people were just either like... Helmet laying Prada. Super minimalist, barely yeah. giving you a thing. And gold was seen as very like 80s, tacky, not... Passe. Yeah, passe. And the flip compartment to this was because that's the first show that Anna Wintour came to of mine yeah. um, is that the show prior one I had done an all white show mm. it was very for a lot of people angelic because of the color white even though for me it was still very avant-garde yeah. and I didn't think of it as angelic because I just used white as this one my first shows uh, were all one color actually mm. And so there was like an all white show, then there was all gold show, there was an all pink show, mm -hmm. and um, then there was like a retrospective. There was a retrospective of a black, white, and all gold because there was a black show as number two. Anyway, so yeah. I, I was very monotonal in color, and I yeah. wasn't doing print yet, which is kind of funny because it's like such uh, things that people associate with me today. Yeah. But I, um, I think a lot of people came to that show, Anna included a lot of people were on board because they had heard about this new American, the wonder kid. And I won this award for the best new talent at yeah. Venus de la mode and all of this stuff. But it was, um, I won it actually two years in a row at that point. I won it for my second show and my third show. And, um, you know, they came, I think expecting something else. It's about expectations. I was still me. I was already living the gold show life in my fantasy mind yeah. while I was doing the white show. And there was already a connection because it was shapes and thoughts and this idea of this like Russian world that was rebuilding. And yes, model modeled after like, um, you know, 80s shopping centers that had been destroyed, but then were being reborn as these, you know, golden palaces. And I had all these fantasies in my head about this kind of, idea of what it was but it was still authentically me so people came to that show kind of expecting what i think they thought was something else and they were very startled and there was a lot of controversy where it really divided the establishment from yeah. let's say the cool kids like i still i mean i had so much editorial from that show because every major stylist and magazine and photographer shot it because they loved it and all the cool kids loved it but um, the establishment was shocked and yeah. people were very made a lot of pronouncements that I should never design again. I should never, you know, like uh, that. It was an outrage. It was disgusting. It was in poor taste. I mean, it's so funny because you look at it. If you look at it today, there's nothing also especially poor taste. There's nothing like actually there's nothing sexual about it. There's nothing yeah. perverse or anything. It was the color gold, but it was at that moment just shocking for people. Yeah. It's weird to think that people are so shocked by a vision that isn't in line or isn't in step with the moment. And, um, I mean, there are so many designers nowadays that get criticized for the same thing. And I mean, I honestly believe that even to this day, a lot of your critics are people who sort of are critical of fashion that is celebratory and optimistic and doesn't have like this 
dark intellectual undertone. Like, sure. yeah, not everybody wants to wear a Mark Rothko, like, inspired, depressing. I, like, I re- heard sure. one of your interviews where you were talking about how, um, <laughs> f- like, five shades of black... Like, you know, like the, the dress is inspired by uh, this artist who did five shades of black and yes. like, and, and at the end of the day, it's just the color black. Yeah. Um, and I think that, um, I think that what sets you apart from so many people is your ability to sort of have no fear to, in, in design, but also have no fear in dress because you make clothes that are so exuberant and so e- exciting. And I think a lot of people are really scared t- because they don't want to come across as too ostentatious or too sort of like um, opulent because that in some ways is considered by establishment fashion people to That's be poor taste, poor taste, tacky, yeah. some might say, but I would in fact argue that please do. Uh, I would in fact argue that doing the same reedition or of some tragic like 90s like boxy dress <laughs> like I'm not going to name brands but you know what I mean like the um is is in poor taste as well because I th- at the end of the day what are you expressing creatively other than this sold really well then and now like that era is making a comeback therefore mm. I'm going to do a re-edition of it it's such a calculated sure. corporatized way of looking at art and fashion and I really sort of like reject that way of design because I think it's so formulaic and so sort of like not true mm. to the artist at hand and um, not to not to pick on Prada, but I'm going to because they sort of have been they they are sort of cons- held to the standard like this gold standard mm-hmm. of design. And I, at some point, I would definitely I loved their collections and they really spoke to me. But then recently, it's just sort of been like, okay, what idea worked back then that now we can like reuse now to sure. to sell shit um because people are so thirsty for nostalgia and that's like the trend of the moment but Prada always was what made Prada special was they were always so against the grain similar to you how you sort of like when everybody was doing this you were doing that yeah and that's kind of what Prada like got its notoriety from and now it's sort of like this very producty corporate mm-hmm. over accessorized like not that there's anything wrong with accessories but <laughs> i mean it's sort of like has in some ways like it's lost its the the soul of the brand in a way mm. to to the mass market and selling things and i think you've been able to stay very very true to this creative vision that you have and I actually want to talk a little bit about your creative vision because you are such a I always compare you to Andy Warhol I always say that you're like the Andy Warhol of fashion because you have your finger on the pulse of pop culture (laughs) in a very strong way and also you are not afraid to be to be um thematic like uh, your collections are very themed yeah and um especially with moschino it's very every collection sort of has like okay we're doing barbie this season we're gonna do game show this season we're going to do um i'm trying to rome and fellini this season um and so i think walk me through the process of how you pick out a, a theme for a collection sure I mean, it's almost like a lightning bolt hits me. Yeah. I can't explain that part because it's the magic of inspiration and creativity. Yeah. And it's always so, it can be so varied. It could come from literally our conversation right now yeah. where somehow I just is like, oh, that's it. Yeah. And it's like that. And it's a, I think insp- I'm so intrigued by inspiration itself because yeah. as someone that, um, is my whole, you know, it's my, my, it's my career. It's my, 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 my happiness and my joy and my livelihood and everything is about inspiration yeah. in, in the sense. Um, but it is something that I could never really tell you other than like that. It's just that magical moment. So the magical moment happens. Yeah. And then I'm like, huh? 
that's it. I've got to do this. I've got to do Barbie. She's going to be Barbie. Everything's going to be Barbie. Yeah. It's going to be Barbie. It's her coming alive. The buttons are going to be off size because she's coming alive. It's this, this thing. You know, all this starts making sense. And it's like, um, you know, when you see a film and they have like a manic person, yeah. it's like that. I become, yeah, that, that. I become yeah. that and I just can't see anything else or think anything else. And I have to like get it out and I have to like go through that process to bring to life those ideas and I'm very obsessional and methodical and it becomes very clear. It's very succinct. And that's why they look, as you described, like so thematic and such a chapter and so so clear in that way because they are very – I think of them really as films in, in my head I, I, It's because there's a character and there's a woman and what does she do? And she would only go here and she would only wear this length and she would never wear that. She would never be seen this way. This is not the way. She would never have a – you know she, whether it's – I mean she would never have anything that's buttoned. She wouldn't button something that's so gauche for her. You know Whatever it is, I get obsessed and that is that person and that's how she comes alive and I just go – crazy about it and I know I do and sometimes even the people that love me who work with me are like okay Jeremy like you can't do a paper doll collection and just have tabs on everything and not allow us to not sell something without tabs I'm like yes we can okay I'm having tabs she's a paper doll yeah. so she's a paper doll and here she starts as a paper doll and you see her first like you know the nude yeah. paper doll with just the little bra and panty and now she's putting more clothes on top and we're building her up yeah. and here's the thing and that's the way it is and it's got to be like this and the back is white because the paper doll is white in the back and there's not a print in the back because these aren't real clothes and, blah, 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 blah. and I just go into my world and yeah. that's why my work looks like it does and it's so so unique and so special. Do you ever compromise, especially working with um, such a, an enormous house like Moschino that has such a, um, a huge retail presence? Do you ever have to make those compromises? Um, how, how much do you compromise in the creative process? I am so fortunate to be able to just run amok and yes. do whatever I want and yes. have carte blanche and not to be policed about what yeah. theme I want to do, how far I want to go with it and all of that. I think I make concessions, but not at their bequest, but at my thought of how am I also going to, I want to reach as many people as I can with everything I do. So I want those items and the purity of them to remain, but I'd like them to be able to be accessible for more people. Now, whether that was at the very beginning phone cases, which were never done by fashion designers until I started that yeah. at my first collection of Moschino, that was just something you bought at the mall or the phone shop and they generally weren't very cute and the ones that started being cute were not really cute finger on the pulse of fashion everybody <laughs> in pop culture and then you know doing just whatever it is that can be uh, more accessible yeah. hopefully by price point because i understand that that's also an issue but even just physicality of wearing something how can i deduce that vision into something you can sit on a couch and wear yeah. that is important because to me a great designer can take their vision all the way there yeah. and if not you're just left obtuse and anyone can do something obtuse yeah. yes i can make things that are obtuse and my things that are obtuse only but I think the better challenge and the harder challenge and the more rigorous challenge is like how do you take the obtuse and distill it and make it something that people can have a bit of it and actually function even beyond let's not even talk about price point but function literally sit where go out in, in the world but it still retain that DNA in a very succinct manner and that's important to me what is a favorite collection of yours and a favorite collection of another designer that you're mm. that in that inspired you or that you sort of fell in love with even if it wasn't something that personally was your style or whatever sure. but let's start with you what's your favorite collection of um, your own of my own that of your I've own done myself do you Gosh, have a fave? I think of them all as children, and it's like a, a asking a mother to pick her favorite child. It seems kind of slightly mean, and I think I go through different moods. Yeah. So there's times where I'm in more one mood that is like this genre of me, and others. You know, I think that my one of my collections in New York that I really love still a lot is um, I did one that was like a Tumblr internet, like right when it started happening, this kind of Tumblr world, and I went down a rabbit hole of, you know, Bart Simpson and yeah. Lisa Frank and glitter and stickers. And I always think that that one was very ahead of its moment and yeah. very cool. 
of my own. I remember that collection very vividly. And I love that one. I love a lot of, I mean, I love them all because they're all, they're all pieces of me. They're yeah. genuine moments of my life and they're, they're very personal. Um, I mean, I think I kind of, I guess the cat's out of the bag with the Moschino one. One of my favorites is, is my, is my, my paper dolls. I just think it's yeah. every time I look at that show and those pictures somehow, I'm just like, I think everyone looks so perfect and it looks so beautiful. And it was like yeah. the wonderful realization of my idea. Yeah. So I, I do love that as like a, a, a live show. I also love the Halloween show and I'm confused. Oh, with Violet. Yeah. You weren't there. No. I, I was not in the, okay. I was not in the Halloween You've done show. so many shows. Sometimes know, it's a blur, like, <laughs> but the Halloween show is a live show circus. You did with me. I know that. Yes. Circus is an, a lot of the LA shows because I was able to get even more, let's say, cinematic with the presentation. Yeah. Circus, Halloween, so love, 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 love as well. Yeah. And I'm really proud of the marionette show, which you're wearing a piece from the collection and, and directing that film and and bringing, you know, something into the COVID age of, you know, how do we deal with fashion when we're not supposed to gather? And there's all these, you know, c concerns and restrictions and, and, and just emotions that can yeah. constructed with that, even as a, a viewer watching a show and seeing models and thinking, are they too close? Are they maybe, you know, ha they had been backstage and was there people breathing on them? And there's some few people in the audience. And was that person wearing, you know, I wanted to remove all of that yeah. from people's mind and just let you like dream. Yeah. Whimsical. Just like live live in the fantasy for yes. a moment. You're very good about delivering fantasy, which I think is so imperative for making clothes desirable to wear. Um, I feel like a lot of your inspirations are very, in some ways, um, uh, not your inspirations, but I mean sort of like the, the themes of these collections um, in many ways, I think can be brought back to a sense of growing up in America, whether it's a Barbie doll sure. or a paper doll or, you know, um, Halloween, like sp sure. spooky, yeah. those spooky elements of like children's costumes, but on grown ups. And so I, what does being an American designer and an American creative mean to you? Like, what does it being an American mean? To I'm Scott? proud to be an American because at least I know I'm free. Yes. Um, I, I've always been happy being that I'm American. I think I have a for an American designer I think I definitely have a, a sensibility that belies that and it's not really true to what people consider American fashion of like Fifth Avenue and that kind of mm. vibe of American sportswear it's you're not Ralph Lauren no and but I, that's good I, yeah and I I love that I twist and subvert um that idea and I know a lot of people have still people mistake me and think that I'm English for some reason. I'm like, listen to me. I don't sound English. I grew up on a farm. Um, I, I feel lucky that I have all of what growing up, especially in a very Midwest American kind of true salt of the earth Americana, you know, I didn't grow up, you know, New York, LA, you know, in any kind of like, Oh, you saw more things or whatever. I grew up seeing the world through television and, you know, the real game world, shows, game shows, dynasty, yep. you know, all, all of the soap operas, you know, hee haw, everything. I mean, anything I could devour from TV, it, it, it sunk into me. I, 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 I loved it. There was glamour and interest in so much, but I was, you know, around a very, you know, normal quotidian Americana and, I think that juxtaposition of those two things is what kind of infuses such a singular um, difference for me, what you're speaking about, you know, and I do play with those things often and bring them into my work because they're part of me. And, but I bring them in a way that people don't ever see them and they don't associate them. So that's what makes it so fresh. And that, that I always think that that, um, juxtaposition that electricity the imbalance of things that's what makes things electric yeah. vibrant new we've seen so much formula for so long 
that's why something should catch your eye. It should strike you because it, it, it's something slightly off. Something isn't the way it was supposed to be, the way you perceived it, the way you know it, the way you've always understood it. And that, I think, is a lot about my work. Even when I play with tropes that are, are very understood, yeah. as, you're, as you're describing, because I do. I play with pop culture and nostalgia. Um, yeah. And a lot of that is, is embedded in all of that. And, and mine does come through often American eyes. Yeah. I mean, there are moments, of course, the bonfire of the vanities, the burn dresses, all of that, which was inspired by like this you know moment in, in Italian history where anything lux, even mirrors were broken and musical instruments and books were burned and, and extravagant silks were burned. You know, that's a very like, let's say oot kind of subject to, to talk about or, or Fellini, which maybe isn't necessarily an American, you know, Midwestern um, inspiration. I am a, you know, a juxtaposition and a, uh, uh, in my, in within myself of the things that I love and I'm inspired by. Um, but I think that's very true to what you're saying. Yeah. I've, I, but back to my previous question, because I've, didn't let even let you answer the previous question was a collection of a, another designer that inspired you another a collection of another designer that inspired me i've loved so many because i'm a, like you i'm a fashion fan yeah. you know i grew up loving it and being inspired by it so you know i loved i loved jean paul gautier everyone should know this was one of my favorites and i used lunch money when i was in high school i wouldn't go eat lunch at all and it wasn't about being skinny. I was already skinny. I was just wanting those clothes. And I would call, you know, like New York and Chicago and Los Angeles and ask them to describe what's on the floor. And yeah. I would then like make friends with the salespeople and they put things aside for me when it would go on sale. And then I'd use all my lunch money and buy like one piece of something, you know. And I was obsessed with Gautier and I loved him. I loved, I loved, loved um the humor and glamour of Mugler. I loved um I loved the humor and glamour of Moschino. Franco Moschino yeah. was, you know, so rich and humorous. I I I loved even when Margela came and this whole other voice, because it, it's to me it's equally the same. It's just yeah. a different note, but it played the same thing. Yeah. And I, I remember being in high school and seeing the first Galliano pieces and being inspired and loving his world, even though it was so different than mine. It's yeah. not my, cause I'm not so romantic yeah. and he's such a beautiful romantic and such an amazing designer. And so I could appreciate exemplary designers that were so different than me yeah. of any kind of taste. Um, one of my favorites is actually from the late sixties is Rudy Gernwright and he was an LA designer and he had his muse Peggy Moffat, who you would probably know with the black eyeliner that she did yeah. and the Vida Sassoon cut, and she would make all her own makeup. And I was been fortunate enough to get to made friends with her in the years that I've been here and spent time talking to her about like things they would do in the shows. And she would tell me how she created a makeup look for each each outfit. And you knowing this as contemporary time as much as I do, like yeah. the thought that you would be wearing an outfit go change your own makeup that you had created into another thing. Come back in to look for that. Yeah. Go back, change your makeup again to yourself. Do your own makeup for another thing. Like how inspiring that the model is a muse. And she was so, I mean, obviously she's very emblematic for us as a sixties icon, just yeah. like without knowing exactly the backstory, but like him and her and their relationship, they're my all time favorite like fashion couple and my favorite fashion designer and I always aspired for that relationship. Oh cool. Oh a hundred percent. And you know, I've had many muses you included in my time. And you, you know, one of my first is a very who she's very well known to people from me and through I mean I say this wrong she's well known as being my muse but also well known because she had a career outside of fashion is Devin Aoki yeah of course and Devin who I discovered at 13 and she, her first catwalk was mine my white show and did all my shows and that's how she got discovered by Carl for doing going on to Chanel and being the icon and muse of Chanel at that Absolutely. time um you know she was one of my very first muses 
Jenny, as I mentioned, Jenny Dimbrow in college. Yeah. I've I've had many muses because I've been inspired by so many amazing women, like Aww. again yourself, who bring Thank to you. life my clothes or my vision and who are inspiring and inspire me and and have a vibrancy. And that's what's exciting. I think beauty is so um, nuanced and yeah. that's important. And it's about the people that embody it. I'm more inspired by ultimately the person inside than the outside. I'm not going to lie. I don't not see the outside because yeah. that's part of, we're human. I have eyes. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to be like, I don't know, but it can alter either way. There yeah, are, exactly. There, there are girls. There are that, beautiful people who are amazing and there are beautiful people who suck. And we know some of those girls in this industry and they can yep. just eat a bag of dicks and shut the fuck up because yeah. mm-hmm. they they may have looked really pretty in their bone structure, but they're you know rotten to the core. Mm-hmm. And there's people that become more beautiful as you know them and, and embody something even yeah. better. And I, I, you know, I, that relationship that I learned in, in early on from Rudy and Peggy yeah. has always been, and still is like, um, the gold standard to, for me and Rudy Gernwright would be my number one all time favorite designer. Amazing. Back to casting. You have like a very sort of, in a way, unique casting of models because a a lot of your models are very, very, very um, good looking. And I find like a lot of people in fashion are oftentimes more drawn to sort of like avant-garde faces. Mm. And you sort of have a very interesting casting. And I want to know what draws you to those, to that, to that Mm. look. Because I, I think many people would say that your casting is very sexy, oh, whether really? it's women or men. It's similar to like a Versace casting. Like, mm. you know what I mean? Like, and I remember one time you told me backstage, you're like, I like men who have thicker legs because I personally have thicker legs. Yes, so like, true. do you identify with that t- brand, like t- that type of beauty because it's something mm. that you see in yourself or because you grew up with or I, I think, I mean, specifically to answer you about the men's, I definitely think of more built men and I know I don't come off as built and it's not that I have like some like abs of steel below (laughs) this sweatshirt, but, um, I do have like more thicker, like muscular legs. And I I, I think it's when I see a guy on the runway in shorts or a bikini that has little too thick legs, I find that whoa shocking and not attractive (laughs) personally yeah obviously you know for those who don't know i'm a gay man so i (gasps) no do like men and so i also you know it's also my my vision of what i think a sexy man looks like in a personal way too so it's a combination yeah um and i never really thought about that that i cast very like beautiful people but it's true that i the girls are beautiful too. Yes. You're, you're, you always have like such an, you know, you always have like the most beautiful girls of that season with the exception of, you know, some more avant-garde faces, maybe like myself or like Remington who both. I think you both are so beautiful. Both you and Remington are stunning. Beauties. She is. She's also stunning, but I, you know what I'm saying? She's sure. a, has a, she, me and her maybe have not anymore. I've, I've done things, honey, <laughs> but, um, back in the day I might've had maybe a little bit more. I always got told I had like a, a strong look. Oh, okay. Um, and maybe, but that's also goes back to what I was saying is like, I see other beauty. There's a surface beauty and there's an inner beauty and there's an inspiration that happens, whether it's a very traditional beauty yeah, or a very avant-garde beauty. There's got to be that connection for me to see someone and that they can embody something and they can pull off and be the character that I have in mind for that season. Yeah. And sometimes it's a seasonal thing because it is like a film and mm-hmm. you cast a role in, in yeah, a film. Absolutely. So there's sometimes there's even, there's some people that are very flexible in my mind and they are any season, every season. Yeah. And that's true. And there's some people that I love and adore that maybe make sense at sometimes and make better sense at others and don't make sense. Yeah. And that part is, um, very, a very nuanced about kind of what theme I'm in or what yeah. moment in that respect. But I, I guess, yeah, I think, I mean, 
I guess I love beauty and yeah. there's nothing, there's nothing, wrong, nothing, with nothing that. wrong with that. You nothing know? wrong with having a good looking model and a good looking outfit on a good looking runway. Absolutely. What in your, what, how would you define beauty versus hotness? Mm. Well, yeah, there are people that are beautiful, but then there are people that have a smoldering quality to them that have something that is a little bit, maybe sometimes mischievous mm. or something that is, sparkling or something that's a little bit different that's flickering inside them so would you say that hotness and sexiness is part of it's more of a no, that's from the inside that's from you think hotness 100%. and sexiness is from the inside and you think beauty can be sort of like a more it can be more surface surface yes yeah good to know <laughs> good answer um <laughs> I've asked a lot of these questions, which is good. I'm like glad we got to a lot of them. Um, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing humanity today? I think it's misinformation. I really think it's dis disinformation and misinformation. Good answer. I really think, and it's across the board, it's from QAnon, which I really hope that they do create... We need like QAnon rehab. I think they really need to create a whole thing to investigate it and break it down because it's really so disheartening and sad to know that so many people believe things that really are completely infactual and not correct and that that's proliferated so much. and So deeply. So deeply. And then... And then you understand why there's these divisions that are so hard to overcome. And and so polarized. Yes. From misinformation yes. to aliens. Do you believe in aliens? Hmm. I mean, as you know, I did a show that you were in with uh, conspiracy, based on conspiracy theories, yeah, actually. Yeah, I do remember um, that show. And the thought that it was, you know, Jackie O, an actual alien. And that this was a whole plot and she got rid of JFK and, you know, what was really going on. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I do believe there's possibility that there's aliens. Yes. That's yes. the right answer. <laughs> the aliens are coming for us, girl. <laughs> At least you'll be here to make them look fierce. Yes. Um, I mean, I think about it sometimes. I think, what if there is this whole other culture and was there a fashion history and alien and, could I go learn a whole nother culture's like style, culture, history, all the different nuances they had? I mean, sometimes it blows my mind to think, wow, because I've like learned every, not, you know, yeah. everything, but so much of what's like fashion history and where it's yeah. come from and how it started and where we are today to think, wow, I could learn a whole nother one in like a parallel universe. Yeah. And it's such a fashion is such a distinctly human thing. And you wonder if intelligent life out there wants to clothe themselves. And if they express themselves through things Other that they means. put on their bodies, yeah. if they even have bodies, that is. Woo. Yeah. That's some deep thoughts right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, these meat sacks we're uh, carrying around. I know. I wonder if they think we're disgusting. And they gross. probably do that meat sack culture over uh, there. Yeah, Blech. like literally gross. Like the the kind of, they would see a fashion show of yours with all those hot buff guys, and they'd be like repulsed, <laughs> uh, which would be pretty funny. Um, so we've both been blacklisted by mainstream fashion establishment for having unique points of view. <laughs> Um, what lessons have you learned from being excluded for being rebellious? Is you have to follow your own voice. You're not going to find happiness by being anybody but yourself. Yeah. You're not going to find happiness by trying to follow the rules that someone else has set up forth or that they, that they say is it. Your true voice is always going to serve you best. And that time will tell. And, you know, that sometimes the moment isn't always really the true um accurate determination of let's say what's right or wrong or yeah. whatever it, it's a moment and let you know let your long history and your arc speak for yourself and i i love that um i now can have a long history and continue to have a long history and i look forward to having a continued long history and be able to look back on that and yeah. and think you know what i did it my way and i was true to me and there was moments that people didn't understood it, misunderstood it, or or even, you know, um, hated against it or whatever the term. 
And, but I stayed true to what I believe in and time, time will tell, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I definitely think you're going to go down in history as one of the great artists of our time Thank for you. sure. I, and I, I say that sincerely. I'm not just saying that because Jeremy Scott's doing my podcast. I'm like, you know, I wouldn't have you on and I wouldn't talk to you if I didn't truly believe in your vision. And I Thank truly you. didn't truly think that you have a very unique perspective that is very, um, very of this moment in a very unique way. And I think your voice is so needed. Thank you. Um, you've been a very hype designer. What do you think about your designs that gives you so much mainstream appeal? What is it about your qual? What about Jeremy Scott makes you so beloved by every celebrity <laughs> and every person who kind of wants to, have a piece of something that's cool, whether it's Kanye West wearing the wing shoes or um, it's Katy Perry wearing the chandelier dress. <laughs> what What is it about you that gives you such mass appeal? I don't know. I mean, that's a hard thing because that's a lot of looking in that maybe I don't really do. Maybe you shouldn't. And, maybe, and maybe, and maybe, yeah, and maybe I shouldn't. I, I, I think that the off-the-cuff answer is that two things i feel like i'm of the people and from the people and that's the people's why designer that's why i'm the people's designer and i think that when you speak specifically about like katie or kanye or any other celebrity that wears my designs i believe that my work acts as a megaphone for them to expand and explore and and express their own visions and so i help kind of widen it and broaden it and, and do that and i think that's why it works so well because yeah. they also see the world in in pop iconography. Katie, a hundred percent for sure does. She's also, very, Madonna, Madonna, Rihanna, Miley, all, all all my girls really have that, and that's why their their appeal is so global in that way. They're too. very they're all, all the women that you dress on the red carpet are so fearless, yeah, and so um also very stylized. Like Madonna has these phases and yes. even Katy Perry has her yes. phases 100%. and Miley Cyrus too. They all have yeah. like these very distinct moments and you've sort of been able to like have a place in a lot of their moments. Yeah. And, um, which is amazing that you've been able to consistently design for each of their different transformations, which I think is like very interesting. And you know how like a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of celebrities I feel like sort of hop from one designer to the next, sure. depending on sort of like who is meeting like their aesthetic at the time. Sure. But you can work with people that are very dynamic and their style changes frequently, but they still come back to you for, yes. for the clothes, which <laughs> is, you know, obviously compliments to your work. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think that's a, awesome. I'm, I'm also, I think a very loyal friend and I have a lot of loyal friends and some of those ladies are, my true loyal friends for you're, life, you know? Yeah, definitely. And you're also, you're super nice. And I think that people in the fashion industry get this like very devil wears Prada, Miranda Priestly <laughs> sure. rep. And I think, but I, and I think a lot of that is true. Like <laughs> I remember watching the devil wears, devil wears Prada and then moving to Paris and actually meeting some of these people and being like, damn, that movie was <laughs> fucking spot on, <laughs> you know? And I, a lot of people have like these personas sure. and I think it's really amazing that I think maybe because of your journey and what you've mm. been through and how you've been treated by the mainstream fashion establishment, you're sort of like not only a rebel in the way that you design and create, but also a rebel personality wise, because you sort of have, despite all of the people criticizing you for your work, um, you've really been able to not only just maintain a level of success, but maintain a level of integrity and dignity and poise and friendliness Thank and you. niceness. And um, I think that's like so special. And I mean, of course, there are other really nice designers out there, but sure. I, I think you particularly are very, very friendly. I want, I want people who are listening to know Jeremy is very, very friendly Aww, and like a really good person Teddy. just to hang out with, like whether we're having dinner after a show oh, in Milan, <laughs> um, with Carlene, love her. Yeah. Um, 
or like if we're just chilling talking or backstage you're just always super super nice um do you have anything for for somebody who sort of is starting to fall into mm-hmm. the trap of becoming a fashion asshole <laughs> like which many people do and i've been guilty of this myself i definitely went through a, a pre-madonna fashion girl oh, wow. phase um what uh, what advice do you give to sort of maintaining your friendliness and niceness? Oh, how funny. I've never thought about it because it's just, it's just who you are natural. Or... So I don't really think about it. I yeah. mean, I guess if I, if I thought about anything, I would think, especially with people that I don't have often the chance to see, Yeah. you know, let's say someone meets me just once, like at Starbucks, mm. I would love for that person to go away with a great impression because I would hate to think that, especially someone that liked me, likes my work, or admires something about any aspect of my life, my work, my journey, that they were turned off by yeah. by that experience. Because I've had that happen by people that I admired and yeah. I respected and I had just adored. And so I would always want that people had a great experience with me because yeah. even if it's very brief that might be the only one that they have they might i might not have the luxury of having to spend getting to spend time with them ever 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 again and so in that respect i would always want that to be an exemplary moment absolutely moving into sort of a, a cancel culture because this is something that now is a new phenomenon that everybody is experiencing unfortunately hydrate yes moisturize um (laughs) so in terms of cancel culture that's something that i've experienced in a small way and you've experienced in some very public ways and i find that i wrote this down just because i I, this this hit me last night tell me and i was and i was like okay this is something i want to talk about with jeremy I truly believe that cancel culture is just straight up bullying 90% of the time, but justified through this noble framework that is social justice, similar to how religion gives prejudice and exclusionary practices, a noble framework through the word of God. Um, I think these people are oftentimes similar people who believe different extremes of the spectrum. What, yes. what is... How does somebody recover from being canceled? How does somebody recovered recover from f- fucking up in a public way, even if the intention was not to fuck up? Because I find that a lot of times the people who are doing the canceling don't they they look at art or something creative, whether it's a song, somebody saying a post on Instagram um a design they put it through a a hair and makeup style used at a show they put it through this their lens sure um and they see it through their eyes and their perception and they apply their perception of whatever it is to you Mm -hmm. even if your perception and your Intention. intention was completely different sure but oftentimes it's it's the people who do the calling out who have the loudest voices. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's very easy to rile, to rile up people in a hateful way. Sure. Um, So like, what is your advice kind of to Mm. breaking out of that and overcoming the cancellation? (laughs) I need this advice for me personally, because I'm probably going to be canceled for some of these podcasts. So First of all, I think you're very astute in what you're saying. It is bullying. A lot of it is very much that. And I'm kind of shocked sometimes when I see it happening to not see that some of these people who, let's just take former President Trump for an example and think, well, that person probably hates Trump. Mm -hmm. That person probably even, maybe even donated uh, for campaigns against him at one point or another, be it the 2016 or the current one or whatever. But they are doing the exact same thing. They're making false accusations, assumptions, and claiming them to be facts, and then trying to pronounce them on such, um, you know, in, in such a large, you know, um, format in a way to try to elicit this reaction. 
and I sometimes I'm stunned and it's things I see happen to other people. Yeah. I mean, yes, there's th- people have accused me of things I did not do. And I think it's kind of sad that people, especially with creativity now and, you know, people think, oh, well, this looks just like that. Well, it actually really doesn't. And you're being very generalistic about it. And sometimes there's similarities because we're all just human. So we're all, you know, um, sharing a human experience. experience together. It doesn't mean that you actually saw something else that was uh, a similar the, to that leaf and that plant. There's there is moments that are just that just happened. Of course, there's things that are like a, a one for one. And then there's things that are just like nuanced. And then you're yeah. being generalistic, like you said, a, a hairstyle or a, 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 a color, or the way it even looks compared in an image to what it is, is completely, completely different. And I think people just really get on a bandwagon. And that part of culture makes me really sad because it, 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 it scares me about how what is it doing to um, damper people's creativity, damper people's expression, damper yeah, people's... Yeah, definitely stifling expression, Yeah, for and sure. that part makes me sad and scared for humanity and creativity in that Absolutely. respect. You know, I've I've just had to learn to, like, you're just going to have to shrug it off because also just a lot of it is, like, I just think of it or try to think of it, like, this is happening in Instagram. This isn't really the real world I walk around in. It is Instagram. Now, some of it seeps because there's like people that didn't, you know. Yeah. It's like a, a pig gets in mud and it rolls around in mud. At one point, you can hose it off, but there's still like a stench of mud on it. Yeah. And now, let's say you never got in the mud personally, but people threw mud all over you. Yeah. And you hosed off, but you still have a stench of mud. That's not really fair. And then it happens yeah. a lot in in our society today from from all kinds of things, famous actors that maybe yeah. had been an accusation that maybe wasn't fair mm-hmm. of, let's say a sexual, you know, note. And it, it's, you know, there's two sides to things or, you know, I mean, all these things are nuanced and They're it's like highly nuanced. Yeah, you know what I mean? And, and, and it doesn't also even mean that that, especially with something like that, that that person that felt violated didn't feel violated for sure, but maybe, that wasn't the, also the intention. Yeah. I'm taking that as one thing, but like, yeah, there's, of course. Cause there's so many, uh, it's such a broad spectrum and it's and, a broad spectrum of cancellation. Yes, People of are getting canceled culture. for fucking anything these days. Yeah. And I think that that's really, I think it's, uh, the pendulum swung very far and I yeah. think like anything, the pendulum will, will swing come swing back. back and that's, what people should be prepared to. But I do also a hundred percent agree with your statement that it's a lot of bullies. And yeah. I, I'm shocked sometimes because I think a lot of those people that are bullies that I see doing this to people, especially online. I'm like, I know you think you're holier than thou and you think you're through a noble framework and you're liberal and you're this and that, but you're just as equally I mean, you say cuckoo puffs as like yep. a QAnon person. And my view, Absolutely. you're like just as equally like believe in things. And I've had, I've seen people write things uh, about me that are completely inaccurate. Like, well, I know he did. And it's like, I, no, you don't. You, don't, <laughs> you, you, you weren't don't there, you crazy Instagram troll. Yeah, you like, don't what know are you talking about, about? This you just assume this, and you, and I also makes me sad that people, whether it's about me or someone else, you, someone I don't know, anybody. I speak about this generally that people assume the worst. People definitely assume, and the that's worst. sad to me. How do you overcome it though? Because you've done a pretty good job of overcoming whether, it, like, you know, whether it's the mainstream fashion establishment cancel canceling you for using gold, yes. or whether it's you know any of the numerous things people can get canceled for nowadays. Yeah. What? How? How? Mm. Through the vision of Jeremy Scott, do you overcome? That's a really interesting question, and and, and I love how because you put you've been that. able to do it. Yes, you know? and I, I think in when you just put it that way it just i mean i'm tingling because i realized before there was cancel culture i was canceled that gold show i was canceled you were I mean, canceled andre though. leon tally who i do love and adore and respect admired said i should literally went on tv and said i should never design ever again you know i mean people that i had yeah. grown up admiring and and you know I, I had richard buckley tom ford's husband write an article about like you know, how I failed as a designer and, I, you know, all these things, yeah. all these people said these things and people turned their back on me. I had been like the wonder kid and then suddenly was like, oh, like person non grata. 
for for having enthusiasm and doing a gold show, you yeah. know. So what I learned from that moment yep. being was that I, I cannot invest my self worth in other people's opinion. That's Absolutely. what it is. Yeah. And I was so shunned by so many people uh, at that moment, and it was so sad and dark to me. And I just had to dig deeper into what I believe and what I thought was right and just stay steadfast and go forward and show my vision and prove that I was true to my vision and that their eyes would change. And they did. Yeah. And they did. And that's what it is. So it's being steadfast to what your what your heart says and what you say and being at the same time. I'm not saying don't be open to understanding what someone else's perception yeah. is because it's important for us to understand other people's perception. Yeah. But it also, you don't have to let it alter, especially when it's a creative endeavor. It's one thing about facts. It's so hard to talk about this and not sound nuanced yeah. in today's terms because there are facts that are real, you know, like mm -hmm. Joe Biden won the election fair and square. Yep. And then there are not facts that are very presented as and, facts. And, and yes, and very these things are very besides just being nuanced, they're also very subjective. What yes. I'm what you may deem as cancelable. I may deem as a minor infaction or maybe just part of the creative process or, or the whatever. human experience. Or the we human don't, experience. We don't all see things in the same way because we're not all, all exposed to all the also, same things we, in the same we way. We are not all fucking perfect. And that is part of being human is it's being, growing, in, being imperfect. And yeah, exactly. And I think that you've do, just done such a beautiful job of carrying yourself and I think you give great advice and I think kind of like if I if I were to sum up sort of what you said it's that stay true to your vision and by staying true to your vision that will set you free from the opinions and the perhaps cancellation of others and I think that you've done a masterful job at being true to yourself. There's only one Jeremy Scott and <laughs> the fact that I'm sitting across from you right now. And I, not only have I walked your shows, but the fact that I get to even have a conversation with you and we have a rapport like this to me is so incredibly meaningful. And I just want to say thank you so much, Jeremy, for coming on my podcast. I'm oh, so happy. I remember when you talked about it as a little idea and yeah. then it's full blown and here it is. Yeah. So thank you for having me. I'm of so course. happy to be included. Thank you. Um, and keep, keep doing what you're doing because you're doing it right and you're inspiring people and you bring joy to the world with your art. And people will remember you for the joy you brought and not for all this other stupid menial bullshit. <laughs> I love you, Jeremy. I Thank you, you so much for coming on. Oh, Thank you guys. Oops. I don't know what I was. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening to podcast number two with my guest, Jeremy Scott. And um, I don't have a sign off yet. Do you have an idea for a sign off I should do for the podcast? Hmm. I don't know. What do people do? I don't know. I have no idea. Don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> Welcome back to my channel. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Oh, Love you, you lots. Love you and too. Until the next time. Bye, guys. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Till the next time. Till the next time. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. It could be as simple as that. I know. I mean, that's hot. It was simple, but it was effective. True. That hot. Ooh. That's hot. Was simple. Maybe mine will be. That's all. <laughs> That's all, folks. That's all, folks. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Oh, my pleasure, sweetie. All right, I think we're good. Yeah.